Hey, how you doing guys? That was intense, thank you. So I don't do this kind of thing very often, in fact, I can count the speeches that I've made on zero hands. This is the first one, so it's all written down and I'm just gonna keep my eyes on the paper and read it to you and hopefully I have something to say that's interesting. Um, so, here we go. Wish I had my banjo. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> How's it going, everybody? And thank you for inviting me to speak here today. Can't see this very well. Okay. The last time I was on stage as a part of IBMA was the very first year of the festival. I was incredibly honored to be the recipient of the first Banjo Award, and I didn't handle receiving that award in a very classy way. This was the year I had formally broken away from the bluegrass, from bluegrass completely, leaving Newgrass Revival and going on the road with the Flectones. In my acceptance speech, I said something like, thank you very much. It's very strange that I'm winning the Banjo Award for 1990 when I played no bluegrass at all this year. I will try to do more in the future. Over the years, I continually cringe when I think of how I handled that moment. Instead of being thankful for the honor of being the people's choice, it appeared that I was saying I thought they were dumb, I thought you were dumb for picking me, and that I was way too cool to care about something like this now that my career outside bluegrass was picking up. And I'm glad to have a chance to explain where I was coming from way back then. At the time, the negative stereotypes around banjo and bluegrass were at full strength. Dueling banjos for all the good that it did for the banjo, it also made it a laughing stock and an excuse to squeal like a pig for anyone who spied a banjo player walking past. And I heard that sound a lot. I was in the first year of attempting to establish Bela Fleck and the Flecktones in the jazz and pop world, and we were, we were engaged in a fierce battle to make it clear to Warner Brothers Records and the music press that we were not a bluegrass band and that our records did not belong in the bluegrass or country bins in the stores. On top of that, I had just emerged from a tough period when Newgrass Revival was attempting to break into the country music scene, and one of our biggest problems was the banjo. In the country music of the 1980s, the banjo had been sidelined for making the music too country, while fiddle, mandolin, and dobro were welcomed with open arms. And radio programs were, programmers were, were quick to tell us to tone down or lose the banjo if we expected any chance of success in this medium. It was like the banjo was considered an albatross, which would sink any musical ship sailing for greater horizons. I had a chip on my shoulder because I believed the banjo could do great things in the world of music, but because of cultural prejudice, it wasn't being given a chance. But meanwhile, back in my bluegrass home world, I had really laid a stinker on the crowd. Bluegrass is the reason I play the banjo. Hearing the electrifying sound of Earl Scruggs on TV in New York City when I was a little kid is what blew my mind and changed the course of my life. I was immensely grateful to have been embraced by the bluegrass community, and I apologize for the young man with big hopes and fears that didn't know how to say this in 1990. I've spent my life trying to make sure the banjo is seen as a serious musical instrument with a lot to offer in all types of music. Along with many other banjo players, I believe we've made significant headway, but in 1990, I couldn't see the future. At that time, my primary concern was emancipating the banjo from the stereotypes that kept me from playing the music that I was dying to play. I've learned a lot in the uh, 25 years or so since then, and I'll attempt to share some of those, those observations today. But first, as keynote speakers often do, I'm going to subject, subject you to my story. When I was a kid in New York City, I fell in love with the stories of the frontiersmen and the Indians. I read every book I could find about Daniel Boone, Kit Carson, Lewis and Clark, the Indian Wars, the Alamo. I had a coonskin cap and I had a leather fringe jacket that I proudly wore all around Manhattan. I even named my cat Davy Crockett. I identified with the idea of these guys who pushed out to the edges, of the edges of the wilderness, trying to live somewhere where they couldn't smell the wood smoke from another home. When they smelled smoke, it was time to move westward. So I guess it makes sense that when I finally started to play the banjo, I thought it was the most natural thing in the world to explore and search for the areas no one else was living in yet and try to expand the edges. It seemed downright American. At age 15, I finally got my first banjo, thanks to my grandfather, and I was fortunate to take lessons from Eric Darling, Mark Horowitz, and finally Tony Trishka, who was my biggest hero. 
And after a year or so of pretty psychotic practicing, I had learned a lot of Tony's playing. In fact, people would tell me I sounded exactly like him. And that made me really excited until one day it dawned on me there already was a Tony Trish graph. That was a big problem for me. I realized I had to stop sounding like him if I was going to succeed as a banjo player. When I got out of high school after playing banjo for nearly three years, I began a professional career moving to Boston to play with Tasty Licks, and Mark Schatz and I moved from there to Lexington, Kentucky to form Spectrum. Spectrum was pretty progressive with swing and pop overtones, but at last I was in the bluegrass heartland and I was in J.D. Crowe's orbit now. That was the point in my life when I made a concerted study of the traditional side of bluegrass. Latin Scruggs, radio shows, J.D. Crow live tapes became my new obsessions. When Crow played at the Newtown Pike Holiday Inn for six weeks, I was there every single night when I wasn't on tour. I heard that J.D. liked White Castle hamburgers. So late one night, driving home with Spectrum, I picked up a dozen and I put them in my freezer to hand to him several months later when I went to visit him. <laughs> I was such a dork. <laughs> he put them in his freezer where I'm certain they still are today. <laughs> I got some tough love from the Lexington and Louisville crowd, Harry Sparks, Harry Bickle, and Steve Cooley being the most helpful and honest. Harry Sparks, the first time we met, he basically told me I was tasteless, my time was bad, I was getting no tone out of my banjo, and apparently didn't even know how to mic it. I said, okay, that's what I'm here for, what do you recommend? And all those folks helped me to understand their truths about the music and became close friends of mine. I also got a real banjo when I was in Kentucky. It was a Style 75 flathead from 1937. And you all know Style 75 is because it cost $75 in those days. I still play it every day. Uh, Harry Sparks set it up for me, and we were so thrilled when we heard it for the first time. I still haven't found a modern banjo that compares to it, and very few of the old ones do. But anyway. Back on the road with Spectrum, we had a pretty strong show and we got a lot of gigs. There were some folks that didn't like our progressive sound, though. And one night, Schatz and I drove over to Cincinnati to see Buck White and the Down Home folks when Jerry and uh, Ricky Skaggs were, were playing with them. Playing in a club, we'd be appearing in a couple weeks later. And there was a chalkboard that showed who was coming up next, and it had Spectrum's name up there. At the end of the night, when we, when we were leaving, I saw that someone had reordered the letters to spell the word rectums. <laughs> So, I know for certain that not everybody liked our group. Maybe the person that did that is here today, and if so, thank you for your honesty. In 1981, I accepted Sam Bush's invitation to join the New Grass Revival. This was a wonderful chapter in my life. Besides the thrill of playing in the band, I was now in Nashville where my big brother Jerry Douglas was and John Hartford and Earl Scruggs and Bill Monroe, among so many others. It was just killer. And what an incredible experience it was for me to play with Newgrass Revival for over eight years. Early on, the group was still you know, kind of an outcast, like, we'll put you guys on at midnight at the festival for the hippie kids, but you're not really bluegrass. Somehow in the years that I was with Newgrass, the band transformed into being a headlining act, and there were even folks in the hardcore bluegrass community that found that they really liked Newgrass. It did have hearts and, heart and guts, hearts and guts, it did have heart and guts, and it resonated for a lot of people, and it was the music of that time. And that's the excuse for our 80s haircuts. They were also of that time. Yeah. I may have had a uh, mullet, yeah. it's uh, possible. <laughs> But I don't think it was a Kentucky waterfall. <laughs> but I'm not sure. <laughs> Things really heated up for Newgrass a few years later. We were signed to Capitol Records. And at that time, being signed to a major label was still a big deal, especially for a bluegrass-related act, and we wanted it to work. I think we might have been one of the only acts of that kind that was uh, signed to a major label around that time. But the role of the banjo on the new grass recordings was an, an important topic now because it could keep us off the radio. So I was starting to take a reduced role as time went on. And I admit to being petrified that new grass would actually have a huge hit and that we'd be trapped for the rest of our lives playing it over and over again, as I saw with some of the big bands of that time. There was still room for me to write an instrumental for each album, but I had lots of instrumentals and ideas that there was just no place for in new grass revival. So we're talking late 1980s now when Newgrass was fighting for country radio acceptance. 
And a number of times I decided that, that it was time for me to leave, but when we got to the stage and we went from, I will fly away when the storm is over into, you've got to reach a little higher, I would start choking back tears at the thought of never playing with those guys again. If anybody asked, I got some sweat in my eyes. And I'd stay for a few years longer. Around the time Newgrass was wrestling with country music, Howard Levy, Victor Lamont Wooten, and Future Man fell into my life unexpectedly. In 1988, I had a chance to do my own PBS TV show, The Lonesome Pine Special, and I formed a band to play some of my tunes. Originally, the idea was to put together a jazz band and feature the bands that were in that context, but when I thought about it, I preferred the idea of finding three nerds like me that didn't really fit in anywhere and attempting something unique. And I like the Goonies. None of us expected it to create the kind of excitement that that first show generated. I wasn't thinking a term, in terms of making it into a real band, but I sure thought it would be a cool album to make, and so we recorded that album in 1989. When I listened to our rough mixes and suddenly realized the potential that this record and this group had, I felt sick to my stomach. I realized that this was the turning point and I would have to leave Newgrass Revival. Suddenly I had the opportunity to dive into something that was far from any mainstream and fight the good fight for originality and freedom of expression. I figured it was likely to be a long, hard road, but I was excited to have an outlet for all the music I was writing and a chance to grow as a musician. Two highways lay before me, and I chose the riskier one. Just in case. <laughs> so Bela Fleck and the Flecktones were now my musical world, and after 13 years of playing professionally, I was now a band leader for the first time. Which brings us back up to 1990 and the beginning of my long sabbatical from bluegrass music. I know there were those in the bluegrass world who thought I had sold out by playing pop or something, but if they listened to the music and heard the odd meters and experimental harmonies we were exploring, they would realize that for a mainstream audience, we were like sunlight or garlic to a vampire. They would run as fast as possible from us. Flectones were considered a jazz group at any folk or bluegrass festival, but we were considered the bluegrass band at the jazz, rock, and blues festivals. <laughs> Sometimes it was culture shock from one day to the next. But any club that would accept us as members, we were happy to be in. We knew that we could never have all the jazz purists, a lot of them hated us, and we could never have all the bluegrass purists, they hated us too. But we could build a crowd that took maybe 20% of the jazz audience, 15% of the bluegrass people, 10% of the rockers, some funk fans, and then we started opening up for Dave Matthews Band and Fish, and you know we could have a percentage of that new jam band scene. And altogether, it, ad it added up to a pretty good crowd. Sadly, the folks at Warner Brothers wanted us to change our music to appeal to even more people, just like Capitol had with Newgrass Revival. But we just didn't want it bad enough to get good at it. What we were good at was being ourselves, and that, you know, actually that was and always should have been enough. Another thing that I learned as time went on with the Flectones was that by avoiding bluegrass, I was cutting off my nose to spite my face. The bluegrass element that I could pretend didn't exist was embedded in the Flectones music in such a profound way that if it was taken out, the music would not work. There was an intensity and groove to the Flectones music that came right out of Flat and Scrubs, Bill Monroe, and the New South. Our feel was deeply connected to that. Granted, I was the only guy in the band who had those connections, but I was the leader, and I enforced them. I pushed them on everybody. We weren't going to do anything that didn't have that forward lean, which I had learned from bluegrass. By the time we got to our third record, I was quite aware that any time we did anything remotely connected to bluegrass, the audience would go wild. I was even starting to do Scruggs tunes in my solos because that was one of the things that this crowd was the most thrilled to hear. Ironically, if we had promoted the same show as a bluegrass event at that time, a fraction of that crowd would have shown up. The Flectones recorded a song called The Yeehaw Factor, a concept which came from Sam Bush and me talking about playing Green Acres in Rutherfordton, North Carolina. Some of you may here may know it as Ruffton, yeah. North Carolina. The Yeehaw factor was an unstable mathematical equation calculated by multiplying by multiplying the inverse square of the backstage pork products and cheese food by the hay bales and the porta potties, and then subtracting 16 points for private indoor plumbing for the artists. <laughs> Anyway, our tune, The Yeehaw Factor, became an audience favorite for the Flectones, as did Cheese Balls in Cowtown, which was a bluegrass tune I wrote inspired by John Hartford's music. A few years ago, when I wrote my first banjo concerto, I made a similar attempt to step away from bluegrass and write a piece that had literally no connection to bluegrass whatsoever, as if I could. But what happened when I got to the last movement and I was looking for a way to land that sucker and make a big impact? 
the biggest gun I could pull out was Earl Scruggs, banging on that banjo in open G. And of course, I didn't do it for long because I'm not Earl Scruggs, but I did do it and it did land the concerto in a powerful way that almost nothing else could have done. I dedicated the piece to Earl Scruggs and I was very touched when he came to the Nashville Symphony premiere where the audience gave him a long and sweet standing ovation. And I believe that's the last concert he ever went to. Yeah, it was heavy knowing he was out there. <laughs> it was really a trip. But Earl Scruggs, originality, Earl Scruggs' originality has been an inspiring force in my musical life. And when I speak to college students or do <coughs> workshops, I always try to make the point that the goal of a musician is personal expression, and that, that each one of you needs to be on a quest to become the you you that you can be. Miles Davis once said, you have to play a long time to be able to play like yourself. He also said, Someday I'm going to call me up on the phone so when I answer I can tell myself to shut up. <laughs> can we teach people to become themselves? And should we? The greatest musicians don't need anybody telling them to try to be different. They just are. Nobody told Earl to play with three fingers or Jerry Douglas that playing just like Josh or Mike wasn't going to be good enough. What I try to do every time I pick up the banjo is play what's happening in my head. Musicians here will all know what I'm talking about. You know what it feels like to hear something coming from inside your head. The key to unlocking the true, unique you is developing access to the music that's happening in your head. But let me tell you something. You can shut down that mu the music that's in your head by denying it. If you don't learn to bring it out into the world, it will go away. And that's a small death. It's also important for you to know what's going on in the surrounding world. If you were deciding what career to take, you'd look for one that needs people, not one that is glutted. It's just smart. Look for some place you are needed. Well, you need to do the exact same thing as a musician. Just like me when I was trying so hard not to sound like Tony Trishka, you need to be aware of what the other people are, are around you are doing and find the places you can apply your talent and energy to make you the unique and special person that we can each be. Unlike the orchestra system, in bluegrass we are not looking for cookie cutter players that fill exact niches. In classical music, they really do need thousands of yes men and women who will do what they are told to fulfill the artistic plan of the composer interpreted by the conductor. Individual creativity is not prized in the orchestra, but the smaller the group, the more individuality becomes critically important, and a bluegrass group is pretty small with four to six players. And when the right combination of individual talents comes together in a small group, the results can be staggering. Right? right. Yeah. When you examine the history of bluegrass, Irish music, jazz, and even rock and roll music, you'll often discover a big bang early on that changes the game. Some huge talents that when combined in a small group set the field on fire or set a course of history into motion. In our world, it's pretty obvious, and I'm taking the banjo, the banjo player perspective here, the Big Bang happened for us when Earl Scruggs was added to the Bluegrass Boys. His banjo was the element that ignited the band's chemistry and allowed it to reach its full potential. That band was so good and so different that it changed the course of all of the lives in this room simply by existing. In jazz, it was Louis Armstrong's Hot Five band which had that, that kind of impact. In Irish music, it was the Bothy band that launched the new age of small group Irish traditional music. In classical music, Johann Sebastian Bach comes to mind for kicking things up into overdrive pretty much all by himself. In my time, the Beatles changed the world of rock and roll in exactly the same fashion that the original bluegrass band did. How do you follow something so incredible? How do you follow the Beatles or Bach? How do you follow Bill Monroe with Earl and Lester? or the New South. These people are so great at being themselves that we all want to imitate them. We want to, be the, we want to be them, not us. The greatest compliment one could give you is, you sound just like Bill Monroe, Earl Scruggs, Tony Rice, Sam Bush. When Newgrass Revival and Spectrum toured Japan, I remember they used to have a Japanese musical counterpart to each American bluegrass player. A Japanese Sam Bush, Earl Scruggs, Bill Monroe, there was even a Japanese Bela Fleck. It was kind of like Invasion of the, ba the Body Snatchers. <laughs> Maybe in the middle of the night they were going to replace all of us. But wait, how many Earl Scruggses do we need? How many Tony Rices, Allison Krauses, Chris Thiele's, or Bill Monroe's? Anybody? <laughs> That's right, one. 
This might be a good time to tell you my Bill Monroe stories. I was around Bill Monroe. Yeah? Sure. I was around Bill Monroe quite a lot, and I even auditioned for him once on his bus. And his comment was, you need to get your hands more together with each other. I can't do a good imitation. His comments and lack of support of Newgrass and Sam Bush are pretty well documented, but the truth is we saw each other regularly and we were usually pretty friendly. One time Newgrass was up at Mo Lake in Wisconsin and he stopped us on the way out of the festival, climbing up into the Newgrass step van with his mandolin on. I have a song I just wrote that I want you to do. He played us a lively instrumental and he said, we were driving up here and I was looking at the woods and thinking, there's no telling these, how long these woods have been up here, so I call it the Old North Woods. Play it, it will be good to you, I promise. And with that, he was off, walking the festival with his mandolin on and a couple of hippie ladies trailing close behind. <laughs> Gosh, I, I wish somebody had found a way to record it, but he was gone. I remember once being backstage at the Opry where Bill and I got into a pretty great jam, and when Sam, but, but when Sam Bush pulled out his mandolin to join us, Bill abruptly walked away. That was, that was cold. <laughs> that was cold, I thought, and nobody in the world loved Bill Monroe more than Sam Bush. But anyway, one day in the early 1990s, I was invited to play with the Flectones on a, a Japanese NHK high-definition shoot. It's the beginning of those high-definition cameras. It was kind of last minute and only Victor Wooten was available, so we agreed to do it as a duet. Bill Monroe was also going to be on the show. And I actually get a call a few days before from Bill's guitarist at the time, who realized that Dana Cup was not available. He asked me if I'd be willing to fill in on banjo for the taping. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible. But would I need to wear a suit? I didn't even have one at the time. No, you just show up and it'll be fine. So that's what I did. Victor and I did our numbers and right in time in walked Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys in full dress. They set up in front of the mics and I sauntered up with my banjo in my early 1990s flectone garb. <laughs> Mullet. <laughs> Bill did not look happy. I guess nobody told him. What are you guys playing? I asked him. He said, Blue Moon of Kentucky, we don't use banjo on it. <laughs> I clamped my banjo on the fourth fret, clamped my capo on the fourth fret, and remained exactly where I was. When we started the song, he was kind of dark, but as I went along, as it went along, and I was playing with respect, the clouds lifted and he cheered up. What's next? It's a fiddle number I wrote, come hither to go yonder. And this was my lucky day. I actually knew the melody in melodic style. By the end of the song, he was dancing around and chopping his mandolin in my ear, and he was very sweet when we said goodbye. Some people are able to move freely between tradition and modernists. Jerry Douglas and Tony Rice, Sam Bush, the whole McCory clan, Stuart Duncan come to mind immediately. Another example is John Hartford. Yeah. yeah. Here's an example of spirit and personality that's very hard to beat. It would be hard to find much that he did that would actually fit within the strict definition of bluegrass. And yet he was beloved by so many traditional folks as well as the next generations. Steam-powered aeroplane led the way into the new, new grass explosion, and honestly, it's still pretty hard to beat as a cohesive, soulful, intelligent, and unique offering. Does somebody want to applaud for that, right? Yeah. I always want to applaud for that record. Back in 1970 or 75, I picked it up after looking at that strange cover on several record store visits and realizing I needed to know what was inside. I still hadn't listened to it yet, so I brought it along on a trip to visit my stepfather's very Italian family deep in Brooklyn, a place called Canarsie. My stepfather's sister said, oh, put it on, I like country music, and everybody was enjoying it until, hey, babe, you want a boogie? <laughs> that was one of the more em embarrassing moments of my teenage years. I raced to pull the needle off. Here's a note to young bluegrass musicians. Always preview any music you are going to play for your parents. Always. John Hartford was a figure that everybody loved. His Christmas parties were attended by Bill Monroe, Newgrass Revival, Roy Acuff, Edgar Meyer, Mark O'Connor, and Earl Scruggs when he was feeling good. 
Why did Bill Monroe love John so much when he certainly wasn't playing anything resembling Bill's music? Well, John was really great at being John, and that was hard not to love. And John loved the whole acoustic music community and deeply valued his place in it. John was very good to me. When he heard that I had never met Earl, he dreamed up a scenario which, which he thought would be a good way for it to happen. He invited me to his place to jam with Earl, but on guitar, which I used to play. Near the end of the jam, he said, Earl, Bela plays a little banjo, too. Oh, well, let's hear some, said Earl. And I played him some jazzy thing, and Earl said, they said it couldn't be done. <laughs> It was a very proud moment for me and the beginning of a warm friendship that lasted and deepened until the end of Earl's life. Thanks, John. That was one of the greatest gifts I've ever received. John and Earl and I went out to Bobby Thompson's house a couple of times when Bobby's MS got real bad. But the three of us would play tunes for Bobby, and it was another great gift to all four of us. John's passing was a very beautiful example of how to go. He had his bed moved to the living room of his house so he could entertain guests without having to go up and down the stairs. And the guests certainly came. The house was packed with people every time I went over there and he was in bed. I went often during his last months and there was always a full turnout of people jamming around his bed. I saw Earl there, the Osborne, Sam Bush, Edgar, so many others. And John led this, the jam sessions even after he could no longer speak by nodding at who he wanted to solo next. Sometimes he'd croak out a song title he'd like us to play. At a certain point it was clear that he wasn't going to make it. Someone had taken Marie aside and told her she should get his best suit cleaned, and she had done so and hung it in the living room closet. The thing was, now John's bed had been moved into the living room, he faced that closet, and when the door was open, he could see in there. She worried about him seeing it and realizing that she thought he was going to die. She cleaned his suit for him to be buried in. And he didn't like to admit that that was what was going on. So she found the plastic five and dime Batman cape that one of their grandkids had used for Halloween and wrapped it around the suit, covered it up, and forgot all about it. When John died, they had three days of visitation at their home on the Cumberland. I made it by late on the second evening, and there was John, laid out and very quiet. I paid my respects and was preparing to leave when the phone rang. It was Vassar Clements. He was on his way over. He begged me to stay. He didn't want to be the only one there. So I waited with the family and John in silence for a while. Then Jamie Hartford, John's son, asked me if I wanted to see something interesting. We went over to John, and Jamie gently lifted John's shoulder and pulled out the edge of a plastic cape. <laughs> you see, the funeral home had received the suit wrapped in the Batman cape, <laughs> and assumed that John, a show business type, national show business type, <laughs> intended to be buried in it. And so he was. We all agreed that John would have absolutely loved this. Which brings me to my final conclusions about Bluegrass's health these days. If you have lots of strong-willed individuals pursuing highly divergent paths from traditional to modern, the music is healthy. When there is give and take and even collaboration between people who are very different, that implies that we're not afraid of each other, of dialogue, or most importantly, of being ourselves. What I would ask of the next generation of bluegrass musician is actually quite difficult. You need to safeguard the essence of the music, yet you must not imitate the past or create museum music. If you want to see this music thrive, first you must truly understand what the elements are that make bluegrass bluegrass. Then you have to go out into the world and live and learn and be inspired by life. Take your own unique experiences and put them into your music. Then you can reach out to the people of today and hit them in their hearts, guts, and brains with modern music that expresses your point of view, all the while you are protecting this precious cargo, the future of bluegrass music. There's a spirit in great music that sets it apart. That spirit exists in all musical genres, but when we hear it in bluegrass, it's a special thrill to us who know the music so well. That spirit and depth is what I'd like to see encouraged and developed in our music. That's the thing about bluegrass that continually makes us all so proud to be part of it. When I started the Flectones after Newgrass Revival, I felt I had to lose the bluegrass part of myself, that it would hold me back in my efforts to be taken in seriously in the outside world. I was wrong. 
Imagine my surprise when I discovered that my connection to bluegrass was actually my secret weapon and my strength. When I wanted to show... When I wanted to show an African village what I was about, or teach Chick Corea, Bobby McFerrin, or Marcus Roberts something they never knew, add myself to a groove with the Dave Matthews Band or Fish, turn on a classical, jazz, world music, or rock audience, or get the biggest reaction of the night at a Flectone show, I'd play some Scruggs. I didn't play them jazz or classical, I played them bluegrass. It's my center, my home, the reason I play the banjo, and it's exactly that which can make me an asset to these other forms of music. But in 1990, I couldn't fully see it. Bluegrass is an inextricable part of my being. I'm connected to a sound that is raw and real and genuine and beautiful. And it's the very reason I play music in the first place. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you very much.